Let's, let's, uh, let's get down to the business in hand. Okay, you didn't come here to see my charm, good looks, and personality. You came for the Word, and we're going to open that there for a little while this morning. These, of course, you can watch them on YouTube. So I'm going to ask you this morning, I'm going to preach this one. But if you really want to connect, you've got to go to part one and part two of this message to really make it, make it go. Uh, in fact, I'm going to tell you something, hearing this once is not enough. Uh, if you will set your set for the next month and replay it and replay it and replay it and get a hold of it, the revelation of it will come. This is a revelation. This is where I live. This is how I do what I do. I'm going to tell you some more stories this morning that will add to it. This is what makes me function. I learned these many, many years ago. I teach these in Bible school. I teach these in conferences. But you're my, you're my people. I want you to prosper. I want you to succeed. So I'm going to talk to you on this subject, the Holy Spirit. Good to see you this morning. The Holy Spirit and your success. You really mean, Joe Corey, this, this is part three, but the, you really mean that the Holy Spirit is uh, interested in my success? Yes, he is. Absolutely. Look at somebody say, yes, he is. Are we recording, fellas? All right. Yes, he is. He's absolutely uh, concerned about your success. You were never born for defeat. That's why defeat hurts. That's why it hurts to come in second because you were born to win. Look at somebody sitting, you say to them, you're sitting beside a winner this morning. When you got born again, you were taken out of the kingdom of defeat. You were brought out of the kingdom of darkness. You were ripped out of that kingdom that made you that you could never win. Or if you did win, you'd have to sell your soul to get it. When you got born again, you come out of that kingdom and sat into the kingdom of success where life would begin to work with you. Where God says that everything, nothing, all things that happen to you, I'll always make a wave of escape. I'll always be there. I'll never leave you high and dry. I won't push you over the cliff. I won't laugh at you when I'm dying. I'll always have another way behind the scenes to bring you out of this. So the devil's defeated before we even start. You've got to keep your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the success. He is the one that wrote the book on success. It's called the Bible. Jesus Christ is the ultimate success. And when you walk with him and learn to, to, to talk to him, etc., let me tell you, you will go from glory to glory. You will begin to excel and begin to increase. You don't always see it in a week or a month, but there's a day you look back on your life and you say, wow, look how far we've come. I remember when we didn't have this, this, and this, but look at us now. And I'll tell you, I'll give you the steps this morning to get there. John chapter 10, don't turn to it as his introduction. John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible, Jesus said it this. He said, it's that thief. It's that rascal. It's that devil. He comes to kill. He comes to steal. And he comes to destroy. Yeah, that's his kingdom. But here's, here's what Jesus said. But I've come for this reason. I've come to give you life. And I've always said that when I read that if he had to put a full stop there, I'd still have been happy. But he, tell you, he didn't stop there. He said, I've come to give it to you. I've come to give you life. And I've come to give it to you more abundantly or in greater abundance. I've come so as you can live on the fast lane. I've come so that things will begin to work for you. Look at somebody say, I'm beginning to get excited already. I know when this is only the introduction. He got you saved. You're born again. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb. You're forgiven of all your sins. You're seated at the right hand with His majesty. The Holy Spirit is seated inside the driving seat of your life. And He's about to take you forward. Isn't that exciting? And the, just to know you're not going to hell, you're going to, isn't that something else? To me, that's success just to get going. But he didn't leave it there. He gave us the Bible. He gave us the mandate, the manuscript. He gave us the tutorial so that we could read it and find the principles, the keys that makes life really work. He's the one that started life. He knows every, every law that go governs it. He knows the principles that makes it work. And so we're going to study some of those this morning. And in particular, we're going, we're going to go down this path this morning called vision. Everybody shout vision. So we're going to read in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4 to verse 8. We've read this one before, but we're going to delve into it again. Because in this particular passage of Scripture... Uh, even though it was the evil one was conducting it, the evil one also was, it was there with the beginning of time when God was laying the foundations of heaven, the foundations of earth. He knows the way God works. He knows the principles. And he knows how to get evil people to work the same principles. They'll work. It's a principle. So out of this, we're going to find God's way of working. Uh, at this particular point, when we are picking up in the book of Genesis, 
uh, uh, the, the ancient population now has grown. It has is, it is grown and grown and grown. And now uh, they come to this point in life where they gathered together on the plains in the land of Shinar. And they came under a dictatorship and a man called Nimrod who had a vision that he would build this huge tower. Uh, it would be an occultic tower. There's a whole different story. I was actually going to sidetrack this morning and go into more of the history of that, and where, but I decided I'd leave that for another day. Even Nimrod himself, there's a whole things we could get into, but we'll do that at another time. I want to detect this subject of vision. But it started to build a tower. Now here's what it says in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. And they said, this is his people, they said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto the heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. This got God's attention. This was not some housing development somewhere. This wasn't a palace they were building. This got God's attention. And the Lord said, now listen to what he said, Behold, the people are one. The people is one. The people is one. They are united in what they're saying and what they're seeing. The Bible says the people are one. They have all one language. You know, it's not just they're all talking English or talking Aramaic or talking Hebrew. No, they're all talking about the same thing. It's called vision. They've caught the vision. Somebody got up and spoke the vision. They've caught it. Now they're all seeing it. Now they're all talking about it. They're all talking about the same thing. And the people has got one mind to get this thing done. They've all got one mind. They've all got one language. Now listen to this. And this which they begin to do. Oh, now listen to the next bit. Now nothing will be held back from them. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. It's not even built yet. It's still in the imagination stage and God says, wow, this is unstoppable. This, if it goes the way it's going, everything they need will be drawn to them like a magnet. They have tapped into a principle that most born again believers haven't even thought about, but it's right there in front of us. They're all speaking the same thing, thinking down the one direction and this that they have imagined. Everybody shout, imagined. This, what they have imagined to do, cannot be stopped. Everything, that's going to be built. He said, except I do it in verse 7. He said, so let's go down and we'll confine their language so they can't speak that talk one to, uh, or the other. And so Lord scattered them abroad from thence from the face of the earth and they left off building the city. They couldn't do it now. God had another key that stopped it. We need to look at that this morning. So in essence, these evil ones are working up godly principle that's been there from the beginning of time. There's principles and they said the people are all one. If we could get the people to think together, in fact, Jesus puts it this way concerning your prayer life in Matthew 18 and verse 19. He says, if just two of you, just two of you would agree on, a, on, on earth, will agree on anything on earth, a touching on any subject, anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. He said, I just need people thinking the same thing, walking the same way, and talking the same thing. This is why prayer meetings are essential. Because in this place, we don't come to talk, we don't come to preach, we come to pray. And when we pray, we agree with each other in our prayers. See, it's no use sitting with six people uh, all praying different things, believing different things. Uh, we're never going to get it answered. But when we come together, when we come together believing what God can do and believing for the miracles and believing that God's going to do it and talking the same way, let me tell you something, it attracts the Lord right in there. Nothing will be refrained from them what's, the, what's they have imagined to do. We can take that further and say when a married couple, a born-again married couple get together and pray together, nothing can stop them. They can dream and have it, envisage a better life and pray things that will come to pass. All you need is two. Look at somebody say, just the two of us. All we need is two that's agreeing with you, talking the same thing, not talking in two different directions, not fighting over the things, but they've come to a common denominator and agreement. If we can get two to agree together, man, he said, God said, I'll be right there in the midst. We'll get the thing done. Isn't that exciting? I love it when married couples get together and pray and they're talking 
especially if they come to the same church, then they can capture the same vision, they know how to do it together, and it will work. But that's for another subject, and that's for another day. It's a principle that they were working. We're sticking with this one. It's called vision. Vision is one of the most important aspects of your success. If you don't have this one nailed down, you will never have success. You'll just float your boat down a river, and whatever way the tide takes it, whatever way the current takes it, whatever way the wind blows, you'll just blow with it until one day you've got a vision of your destination, and when you get that, you can steer your boat right to where you are. The gift of sight, it, just to be able to see is phenomenal. I was brought up in a house where my dad was partially blind. He was registered with the Blinds Association, so I knew what it was like to live in a house where somebody couldn't see, couldn't read a newspaper, couldn't read a book. I knew what it was like to be bringing, uh, brought up in that house. I see it. Thank God for vision. Thank God for 2020 vision, even if you have to have a little lens expansion so as you can read. But thank God for eyesight. Look at somebody and say, he's right. But there's something different. There's one step more in the spiritual. It's the gift of foresight. It's the ability to see beyond where you are right now. And that's a God thing. If you can ever learn by the Holy Spirit to see beyond where you are right now, not get caught up with who's doing what, where we are, and the lack of money, the lack of whatever, but see beyond that and see what God sees, you can, drag, you can steer your life in that direction. In fact, no invention, no development, or great feat was ever accomplished Without, uh, uh, without the inspiring power of vision. Somebody had to have it first. Civilizations were born and developed because of the driving power of men and leaders with vision. The canvas of history has been painted with the creative force of vision. Vision makes the, the invisible. It makes it visible. Sooner or later it comes to pass. It makes the impossible possible. The vision makes the suffering and the disappointments, it makes it bearable. Vision doesn't make it go away, but it makes it bearable because you'll understand this is happening to me right now, but there's better days ahead. Look at somebody say there's better days ahead. See, if you don't think there's better days ahead, then you'll never have better days. But if you can see beyond the moment and say, I don't know what, but I know God's got something good for me. He's making a way of escape for me. And if you can glimpse a tomorrow that you don't have the sickness or illness in it, but you get a breath of fresh air, if you can just glimpse it and hold that vision, let me tell you, it'll pull, out, pull you through the desperation place you're in. It said in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 about the Lord Jesus himself. He said, look, we're looking on to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, there was nothing good about the cross and as far as the suffering goes. But, but the Lord Jesus was be able to envisage it. Not the cross, he knew you had to go there, but he was able to see beyond the cross. And he saw you and I coming and knew there was no other way for us to get to heaven except he went by the way of the cross and he didn't look and glance and study the cross. He studied beyond it and looked from the ages to come. Even him, he said this, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. I'm going to tell you something, for the people who weary and the people who faint in their minds, it simply means they're locked on, logged on, and focused on what is happening to them right now, and they've lost the vision of the future that will catapult them right out through that. Once you get vision, you will not stop the problems, but it will make it more bearable. The Bible said about Moses, it said that he endured, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Every now and then he got his eyes off God and got it under the circumstances and then he had chaos. But the minute God appeared and talked to him again, he was back on track. There's a man in our time called Nelson Mandela who served 27 years in, in prisons, a political prisoner. Whether we like him or whether we don't, whether his political persuasion is yours or not, we're not interested, not this morning. We are interested in what made the man tick 
27 years, moved from prison to prison. Everywhere he went, he was tortured, had brutal tortures. And in one of, if you read his book, you'll find there's one account where the guards took him outside and they dug a hole and they dropped him in standing and up straight and they buried him from the neck down in, so, in the soil outside his prison cell. They buried him in the outside in the African sun. When the African sun would come up, there was no water for him to drink. There was ants eating at his ears. They left him stand for days. He was buried standing up in there. And then the sun would come down upon him. It actually said about the guards, they would come and they would relieve themselves over the top of him. But let me tell you something. Every time they'd pull him out and put him back in the cell, he would whisper to himself. He said as he would whisper to himself, one day I shall be president and one day Africa shall shall be free. There was something in that man, no matter what life did to him or people did to him, he could see beyond. Look at somebody say, I've got to see beyond. I've got to, if you can't see beyond where you are right now, you'll become weary. You'll become faint-hearted. But if you can get a glimpse beyond this and say, wait a minute, God's on my side. God has something better for me. You'll get a hold of life. Vision generates hope in the midst of despair. Vision inspires the depressed. Vision motivates courage. If you, don't, if you can't see a better day, you'll have no courage to rise up against that that opposes you. Vision is the foundation of courage. Vision, vision is the fuel of persistence. You'll keep on, keeping on, keeping on, if you know there's something better at the end of it. Vision inspired uh, civilizations and leaders down through the years, like the one we read in Genesis, the first biblical empire, the first kingdom that was established on the earth by a man called Nimrod because he had a vision to do it. Vision produced the Egyptian civilization that uh, 4,000 years ago they built huge pyramids that people fly over on holidays just still amazed by what somebody had a vision to do back then. Vision motivated the, the Roman Empire to colonize the whole known world in them days. It inspired explorers to circumnavigate, uh, uh, circumnavigate the globe. And it, it, it inspired men to go, to go put a rocket and take men onto the moon while other people were still living in mud, mud huts. It has to be this one thing called vision. Vision gives us, give us over the years thousands upon thousands of inventions that has transformed the lives of humanity. It is vision that caused flight to take place because of two young men who saw a vision of them flying like a bird down a beach and they built them the, uh, the, the plane in them days. The vision of a light, not using a candle but an incandescent light bulb by a man called Edison. He kept on failure after failure after failure but kept saying, we'll have another go, we'll have another go because he had a vision in his, in his mind of this, the, I can do it, I can do it. If you have no vision, you'll quit after the second attempt. But if you've got a vision, man, that will pull you out of bed in the morning and get you going forever and forever. The church needs vision. Look at somebody say, he's talking to me now. The church needs vision. We need a vision of souls being born again, saved, and coming into the kingdom of God. We need a vision in this church where every church is packed, filled. Every church where they're lining up outside to get in. I got a vision for you and your house of your husband and your wife and your children sitting on the same row and having to put up a second row because your granny and your uncle comes in the following week. Let me tell you, we've got to have vision to see a church full. We've got to have a vision to see time times of refreshing rolling into a tired and a weary nation like this. We, we need to see the Holy Spirit generating revival, generating awakenings to happen, but you need to see it. There's a man called David Livingstone. If you read his uh, biographies and autobiographies about him, you'll see there's one uh, line that got me and I never forgot it. And it said that a morning he walked up the hillside and he said he climbed the hillside at dawn to see the smoke from a thousand villages where no one had even heard of the name of Jesus. And I guarantee you, when, it, when I read that, I thought, man, that's what inspired him to go through the interior of Africa. When I read that, and I read it, and I read it, and I, I was writing it in the notes yesterday, I said to myself, I guarantee you, he didn't climb the hill one time. But I guarantee you, he went up the hill a thousand times to see the thousand villages. It would keep the vision alive. 
You've got to learn to have a vision, write it down. You've got to get a picture of it. You've got to keep that vision alive on the inside of you. You need vision for you to break out of where you are, for you to turn your world around, for you to get your ship turned in the other direction. You need a vision of where you're going and how God is going to do it. Proverbs 29 says this in verse 18, where there's no vision, where there is no vision, the Bible says the people perish. Now, we can look at many translations that will show you that in a different light. And one of the translations says, uh, where the people the, the, the perish, the people go back. They go back. Let me tell you, if you don't have a vision, you'll stay stuck where you are right now. 20 years from now, you'll be no different. Because vision is what pulls you out of where you are to where God needs you to be. You've got to have something ahead that's big, that's bad, that's good, and it's pulling you right across. It rips your anchors out. You say, I've got to go there. Look at somebody say, I've got to go with him. <laughs> Absolutely. You've got to have vision. Then they don't have it, they just keep going back. They just quit giving up. There's another translation say they let go. They let go. Another one says they're out of control. In other words, vision puts boundaries in your life. You know what you can do and what you can't do because you're heading in this direction. Another translation says, a modern translation says, you're stuck. Look at somebody say, mm-hmm. Did you ever feel you were stuck? You ever, well, you know what's wrong? No vision. You need to get back and say, God, show me some, another part to this. The vision pulls you out of the stuck place. And the, in, in essence, it's a place because they can't see an end. Translation says, instead of parish, it says they can't see an end. Laura and I went for a walk. We are, listen, we've only started this, so it, we don't have to walk too far before we get exhausted and we're looking for a coffee shop. Or we're wondering if we bring a picnic with us. But it was one of these ones recently. It was a little wooded place. And, and, and we started on the tough stuff. We, were, we got halfway along. We'd walk for quite a while, you know, with the dog with us. Walk for quite a while. And it's all an uphill kind of climb. And we got there and we kept thinking, how much further? And then, and then and Laura says, maybe we should go back. I says, no, you should come back. I think, I think we're more than halfway there. We'll just keep going. I said, I know there's a bridge and we'll cut across it. Well, we walked till the sweat was dripping off us and the dog was going, eh, eh, eh. And, and we had walked quite a while and I saw the bridge. And when I saw the bridge, there was a big sign across it that said, you can't, no entry. The bridge is broken. The bridge is down. She said, I said, we can't go back now. Look at somebody saying, no going back. So we had to walk on, walk right out onto the road, walk across the road, and then walk back. And, 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 and uh, let me tell you, we were, we were tired now. You wouldn't have been tired. You could, you could have done that with your eyes closed, but not us. We were walking, and we're struggling now. And, and the longer you walk, the long, I mean, we're walking for maybe an hour and a half now we're walking, and the two of us are bushed. You know what I'm saying? We're tired. We're dragging our feet. Even the dog's just gone. He's not running after, sniffing the ground anyway. He's just dragging along with us. And we're going, and I kept saying, do you think we're there yet? And, 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 and we, but we weren't. And the longer we're on and the word we kept saying, when they are there yet, the worse it seems to get. But eventually we turned this corner and it took us up another hill. I said, Laura, here's another hill. Anyway, we got halfway up the hill and you can see across this way. And lo and behold, I saw the car park. I wasn't there and you can't get to the car park from there. You're still a good way to get around to get the car But I saw the car park. I said, Laura, Oh, I see the car park. I can see the car park. She, she said, so can I. So we got excited because we could see the car park. In other words, you can see an end in sight. We could see the end in sight. We weren't there, but we got the second wind. We were able to get some things going, and we were able to get, get the car. Say, that was exciting. <laughs> but let me tell you, if, if a man or woman has, can see no end, if you can see no end, I wonder when this is going to be over. Is it always going to be like this? I wonder when normality will resume. I don't think so. The doctor said this and the doctor says that. And, and I mean, you don't see no end. You'll tire. You'll say, I'll never come down this road. Glad I ever started this path for first. What are we doing out walking? In fact, I actually thought at one point, I thought, I wonder if I should have phoned Neil <laughs> and tell him to drive the car down to that end. We'll just get in the car and you can drive us up to pick up my car. <sighs> I'm a man with motives. But anyway, but, but if you can't see an end of a thing, you'll tire. You'll retire. You'll quit, and you'll give up. The man who keeps going is a man with a vision. You're not there yet, but you've glimpsed it. You see, you saw somebody else doing it. You read a book about it, and, and all of a sudden you say, wow, 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 just keep going. One more, get, get out of bed one more time. See, you were born to achieve something significant in your lifetime. 
You are destined to make a difference somewhere, somehow in this life. Your life has a God-given purpose to it, but only vision, only vision will enable you to do it. You'll never accomplish it because you'll never know what it is. Paul said, I ran my race and I finished my course. Most people don't even know what their race is and don't even know what their course is because they've never visioned it. They've never seen it. But a lot of you can see it. You can break free. Remember, when you see it, it breaks the limitations of you. You can do it. It enables you to reach out. It enables you to grasp what God wants you to have, what God wants you to do. I read a story many years ago about a zoo in Chicago. The, the, the zoo had become dilapidated. Even the animals were tired and weary looking. Nobody was turning up. So they decided they'd build a whole new arena in, in the zoo and they'd make it lifelike, make it like the Amazon, the jungle, you know, and make it so, so. So they set a whole architectural deal in and brought people in who could plant the jungle. And they did it and they said, we need, we need a, a spectacle, an animal to put in this. So they decided they put a lion in this jungle that people could come and see. So, so they went to uh, the Serengeti, and there they captured themselves a, a young wild lion. And they flew it back across to America as they started to build this great zoo and to plant the plants to make it into a jungle-type scenario. And it was taking longer than they expected to build, but meanwhile they had this lion over there. So they built, they built an enclosure. They built a place for it to sleep, but they built an enclosure. And they said it was four meters long by one meter wide. So this young wild lion would come out, and every morning it would start at one side of the cage, and it would simply walk four meters it would turn and walk four meters back. It would turn and walk and walk four meters. That's all it did. It took them two years to finish the zoo. So for two years, that lion, that young wild lion, just walked four meters one way and turned around and walked four meters back. So the day came they finished it, and the pride of it was they were going to put this lion in the midst of the enclosure. So they had a great crane that lifted the cage and sat it right in the enclosure. And so they opened the door, and the old animal wouldn't come out. They had to coax it. Out. Eventually they coaxed it out, and when they coaxed it out, they got the crane to lift the cage back out of the place. But you know what they noticed? What they noticed? The lion just kept walking to the place, and it turned round, and it walked exactly four meters this way, and it turned round, and it walked four meters that way. It's all it did, because it's all it ever saw. Someday you've got to see yourself outside of the boundary lines that traditions, cultures, and even what you, your present circumstance has put you in. You don't understand that Jesus broke you free from a, from a four meter by one meter life. He broke you free out of that and said, I have places for you to go and I have places for you to see. But oh no, we're going to Port Roach this year again. Oh, I got my car on oh, down there in Cranfield. That's right. Tw Four meters by three meters. Everybody said four meters by three meters. Well, my granddad used to go there and my granny. So look at somebody say four meters by, by one meter. Because <clears throat> we just do the same. We haven't put a fence around our life. Look, you want to tear the fence down and understand there's something else beyond where you live, beyond your county, beyond your nation. There's something else that you have never explored. There's somebody you've never met. There's somebody that will love you. Look at somebody say, I, 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 I like you. <laughs> yes, but there's somebody who will love you. There's somebody that will listen to your preaching and to your teaching. I, I told you this before, but it fits where I am right now to help you encapsulate this. But I was uh, heading down to actually past Killigan Man. I was uh, going down to the shop, and it was coming to the news time. It was about two minutes to news time, to midday. And, and I like listening to the news. I like up being updated. But anyway... I, I turned it on and it was early. There was a young man singing. I thought, well, if I switch it off now, I'll, I'll forget the switching back on, you know, so I'll just leave it listening to singing. And, 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 and as soon as he sang this, this uh, woman uh, interviewer, she turned around and said, fantastic. She says, that's a beautiful voice. She says, I understand you just won this fantastic, fantastic talent competition. And she said, wow. She said, you're going to go places, son. You're going to go. She said, 
here, as soon as the news is over, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what you're going to do, where, where we can go to hear you next, where we can buy your records, etc. And so I thought, well, better keep an eye on this thing. So as soon as it was over, on came this young man. They allowed him to sing another song, and he had a great voice, no doubt. He had a great voice, and then she began to say, now nah, she said, we need to talk. And, 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 and she said, I've got to ask you a question. Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? And I thought, got to hear this. So I turned my radio up, and she made, he made this statement. She says, ah, oh, he says, I don't know. He says, as long as it's something to do with singing, he said, it'll be all right with me. I switched it off, and I started to talk to my radio. Have you ever talked to your radio? <laughs> I switched it off, and I talked to my radio. I said, you're going nowhere, sir. You will, be up. You will never reach the dizzy heights of fame. Nobody will ever remember you. Your songs will never be sung. In fact, I'll probably never hear you again in my lifetime. It's over because you've got no vision for your future. And I wiped the sweat off my brow and said, that's that sorted out. You know, I've never heard that guy singing in my lifetime again. It's not because I prophesied. It's because he had no vision for his future. Absolutely no vision. All he needed was a future for his tomorrow, and that would have drawn him along. Like a magnet, it would have pulled himself to it but he couldn't see it because vision is your roadmap. Vision is your blueprint from heaven to tell you about your tomorrows. Listen to this. Your future is not ahead of you. Your future is inside of you. We need to put that on Facebook. Did you get that? Your future is not ahead of you. Your future is inside of you. Look at somebody say, I got that, I got that. In, 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 somewhere in the 20th century, in the mid-20th century, in a, a place called Thailand, Bangkok, the government decided to build a new road the whole way from one end of the country to another, a massive highway, a massive dual carriageway. And they decided, but in order to do that, they had to plow their way through villages that had been there for decades and centuries. You just plow, just plow a village down to put this big road up. And they came to this one village in particular that had to go, and there was a huge statue they had a statue to uh, one of their idols at the, at the bottom end, right where the road needed to go. It was a big clay statue. It was 22 foot high. Work that out in meters you want, but 22 foot high. And it's a massive statue of their idol. And, and, and they said, that's been there from the beginning of time. You can't shift that. So the government said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll bring in a big crane. We will lift your statue, and we will put it over there in the jungles uh, so that we can put this road through. They said, aye, that's okay with us. So they brought in these cranes to lift it. They tied it up. They got it together, and they lift, and they got it up off its base, and as they're starting to move it, it started to swing. As it started to swing, there's a massive crack came right down the, came right down the clay the clay statue. It just began to crack. There was little veins of cracks came out from the side of it. And to the horror of everybody, there was a bang and a puff of smoke, and the clay just fell right under the ground. And in the horror, when the dust settles, people looked up. Now what was hanging from the crane was a 22-foot solid gold statue. It had been there all the time. But nobody saw it until something moved. The Bible says you have, you have got treasure. And look at somebody say, you're a beaut. <laughs> look at somebody say, you're fantastic. <laughs> the Bible says we have this treasure in earth and vessels. But the fact is, is we got so much clay rent, nobody sees it. You've never even seen it yourself. Inside you is something that God himself has ordained, something God put there and something God put on the earth. And let me tell you, he needs you moving so the old stuff falls to one part. I'll tell you what will move you. Vision of who you are, what you're accomplishing, what you're going to do. Look at somebody say, I've got to get a vision, got to get a vision. Absolutely. So we touched on this last time we taught on this subject, so we'll touch on it again. But how does this vision come? Well, when you see how it works, it's so easy. How does this vision work? Well, we see how they did, they, they got all their, they were all one talking, they were all one vision, they were all one conversation. So God came down to stop it. And how he stopped it in the book of Genesis, he hit their conversation. 
so they can no longer talk about the dream, no longer talk about the vision. No, nobody's talking about it anymore. When they stopped talking about it, the vision died. And then the whole thing stopped dead in its track. You know, the enemy knows that. So he'll divert you with all types of problems, all types of crises. He'll bring people into your life, set people out of your life. He'll destroy. Brings all, just to distract you. So you're no longer talking about the dream, no longer talking about the vision, no longer talking about what God wants to do and how God wants you. You don't do it anymore. You know where you're going now? In circles. Nowhere. You've got to learn how to get the speech back in correction. Get your unity, get, your, get the vision going, and begin to talk about it. Begin to dream the dreams. Because as you begin to speak, your words, I described this philosophy, your words are painting pictures on the canvas of your heart. When, when you hear things, it's automatically, I'm talking, but it's painting pictures on the inside of you, in the canvas of your heart. And let me tell you, so you start talking wrong words, you're painting wrong pictures. You're giving yourself a new direction. So let me tell you something. Here's what you need to do. You need to start painting the right pictures on the inside of you. And your thoughts now will come around and begin to add to it. Think about it. When you begin to add to it long enough and you begin to think about it long enough, it becomes an imagination. Are you with me? And if you play with the imagination long enough, if the Holy Ghost gets a hold of it, out of the imagination comes a vision, and vision is your direction. If you don't get your thought, your conversation right, your thoughts won't be right. Your imagination will be wrong and you'll never have vision. Am I helping you? Imagination is powerful. It's for you or against. It's up to you which way you use it. It's up to you what you put down on the inside of us. So we pray for prosperity. Most never see it. You pray to be well, but most never receive it. Never receive it. Because you never actually see yourself prospering and you never see yourself getting better. You never see it. And I can tell you why you never did. You say, I'm reading all the time. Let me tell you, that's not the game. I'm telling you the secret right here. You don't see yourself getting better. You don't see yourself prospering. You don't see yourself having any better than what you're right now. And I can tell you why. Because you don't talk about it. If you can see it, you'll talk about it. You don't talk that way anymore. You don't talk about when I'm better. You don't talk about we're going on holidays. You don't talk about I'm going to make plans. You don't talk about I'm going preaching. I'm going to the mission. You don't talk that way because you don't see it. If you could just talk that way till you did see it, it would become an imagination. And before you know it, out of your imagination, you'd have a vision and you'd be away. You're just running in the wrong direction. Start now and get it right. You've got to start talking about it. Paint pictures on your imagination of you being and going and having and doing. Look at somebody saying, I'm going to paint you in mine and we'll do it together. If you want to be successful, if you want God's best and God's potential to come, out and come with you, you have got to learn how to switch on your imagination. Your vision is a mental image produced by imagination. And vision is what you're looking for because that's the direction of your life. Now we've got to get down to the scriptural side of it because it'll work, it'll work both ways now. Whether you're saved or whether you're not, it's a principle that works. But for born-again believers, we need the Word of God. You need to saturate yourself in the Word of God. Read it, read it, read it. Read it in a translation at least you can understand. Read it in three translations so you get the one you're trying to do. Start off with the easy portions of the Bible. See the Gospel of Mark and see Jesus bringing he people getting healed. And then read it long enough and talk about it and hear yourself reading it. Read it out loud until you can almost imagine yourself being there because one day it will become a vision for your life. Read it, read it, read it. Hear yourself saying it. If you don't want to read the whole Bible out, Bible out when you come to a bit that's yours, then just say yes and read that out at least so that you can hear yourself saying that and suddenly, the, see the Bible's alive and when you get a hold of one of them living words, your imagination starts going and suddenly the Holy Ghost makes it into a vision for your life. Imagination only works with the information you're given it. I got a scripture. I'm going to tell you this. Here's what I was, I was talking to the Lord a while back about finances. About me. Not about you. I'm not looking yours. Me and the Lord. He says he's my source. I said, you talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. I mean, so I was reading the scriptures, and I, I, I came as, in my daily reading, I came across this when I was just thinking about finances, and I came into this in Numbers chapter 18. I was reading it out of the NIV, the Northern Ireland version, and it said in Numbers 18 and verse 11, it says, this also is yours. <laughs> Look at somebody say, tell me, tell me. 
This also is yours, whatsoever set aside from the gifts of all the way of offering. You'll not understand this, but let me get through it. The way of offerings, I'll give it to you and to your sons and daughters uh, as a perpetual share. Everyone in your household is ceremonial, clean, and eat. Now listen to this. Here's the bit that got me. Verse, verse 11, it says, I'll give you the finest. Everybody shout, finest. Ooh, and I read that. He didn't say, I'll give you the leftovers. I'll give you the second-hand job. No, he said, say, say, when, it, when everybody else is finished, we'll, we'll get, when it's all worn out and dusty, we'll give it over to you. No, 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 no. Here's what he said. He said, I will give you the finest. That's the best. I'll give you the finest of the oil, the finest of the new wine, the finest of the grain, the finest. I'll give you the first fruits of the harvest, all the land, the first fruits that the Lord will bring, that, that, that the people bring. God says, I'll cause them to give you and, every, uh, and also to you and your household. I'll give you the finest. Everybody shout the finest. I, all the years of reading, 40 years of reading, I never saw it, but when I saw it, it got my attention. He, I said, he wants me to have the finest. He's going to give me the finest. Underlined it, underlined it. And then I thought about the last airplane journey that I took uh, for a good uh, conference, and I was tired. It was an early one they called the red, was it the red eye flight? Is that the one they called? It's the one that's literally in the middle of the night. You get up early and you're tired before you get there. You have a three hour journey after you get there. I was bushed and I was tired. I thought about that one. I thought he's going to the finest. So I kicked my chair back and I stood up and I said, I'm making a declaration. I'm not flying in the back seat of an airplane anymore. Look at somebody say, that a boy, Joe. Go get him. <laughs> I mean this stuff because I seen it. He says you can have the finest. I said, we'll start here. I'm not flying on the back of an airplane anymore. There's good people and bad people, and they're sitting up the front. I said, I declare I'm going to sit up the front. <laughs> I mean, ten days later, I, I got an invite to go to uh, Amsterdam uh, in May at the end of May. Yeah, to do another conference. And this time it was a lady, she phoned me, she says, uh, uh, I'm the one in charge of, of, of setting this up for you. I said, really? It was a gentleman done for you. She says, no, uh, he's not doing it. I'm doing this for you. She says, uh, how will you be flying? I said, in an airplane, hopefully. <laughs> she said, will you be coming? I don't know if you're allowed to advertise or not, but easy, Jet. I said, probably. She says, no, 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 no. Men of God don't travel in EasyJet. She says, you'll be coming KLM. <laughs> she says, you'll be coming KLM. And then, I'd just been talking to someone, made a declaration. I'm not sitting in the back of the plane anymore. And here's a woman that I've never met and I don't know. And she says, I'm booking this now. We'll book your flights. And she says, we're flying KLM. They're wider seats, more leg room. I said, that's exactly what I need. <laughs> well, I'm built for airplanes. I got short thighs. You know, you can fit in. You can fit into the overhead cabinet if necessary. But let me tell you. So, so she says, says, we're setting you. She says, would you mind sitting up the front? I said, if you can get me in beside the pilot, it's close enough to the front beside <laughs> Oh, she said, you're such a joker. I said, no, ma'am. I said, you put me down at the front. Put me in law up the front there on that KLM. And she says, I see down on your notices that you're staying in a hotel. I said, that would be right. That would be right. She says, well, there's no use booking a room for your good self. She says, I'll just book a suite. <laughs> I'm thinking, yep, me do now, yep, me do. As soon as this woman finished, I'm going back to Numbers chapter 18 to the finest. Let me shout the finest. I thought, how did I miss that before? Why am I? I years ago, I could have made the same declaration, had a vision of me traveling up the front. Look at somebody say, we're never traveling. Look at somebody say, I'll say we're not traveling in the back anymore. <laughs> Ah, it's like the Lord said, Joe, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? See, things that happen to me, I tell people. Not that you turn around and say, hey, Joe's traveling here. No, no, no. It's a principle. It's a principle. If it works for Joe, it'll work for you. I saw it. He said, I'll give you the finest. The finest. You don't have to have rags. You don't have to have, have something everybody else has worn 16 times. No, God says, I'll give you the finest. Then you need to start and believe for the finest. I was in that, last time I was in Amsterdam, I was sitting, this place was massive, it was packed. But there was a lot of well-to-do people. <laughs> I 
reason. And anyway, there's the man who's actually running the whole show, and he's sitting up the front. And he's sitting just like you, Ali, sitting with the leg crossed like that. I, would, I would, don't know how to do that. I'd have to train this leg to bend. Anyway, but he was sitting, he was sitting bent up, but on his knee was a, was a, a laptop. He was sitting there, and no matter who was preaching, he was typing up. I thought he's stealing people's sermons. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. If you're listening to this, you're not. You're writing the book. He writes books. So he's, he's writing. And I looked, and I thought, wow, look at that laptop. Look at that laptop. It's so thin. It's, it, it, and, and he's just sitting typing away. And I looked, and I thought, I need one of them. Look at somebody say, Joe needs one of them. And there's the old voice that comes, sure, sure, you have one of them. And you have, you have that iPad Pro and all. How much more do you? I thought, I know, I know, I know. But I like that. It's got a keyboard. I could, I could be typing with stuff. And all those. But I didn't think any more thing about it until the Lord said, the finest. Everybody shout, the finest. And so when I'd sat down after I'd booked my ticket, <laughs> I said, Lord, you said the finest. I saw a man of God having a laptop, a real thin one. He was doing his books on it. I said, I could write a book if I had one of them. I said, thank you for one of them. When the door opened, oh, my house. <laughs> and somebody larger than life walked in and said these words, does anybody here need a new laptop? Uh, as, yeah, uh, uh, uh. Yes. And so I had to wait another day. The waiting's the worst. I had to wait a whole day to see what this laptop was going to be. It was one the same as that was on the man's legs. The ultra thin ones with the keyboard and the beautiful screen. And I looked and I thought, wow, wow, wow. Thank God for these people. I actually offered them money and they said they didn't, they didn't want money. But I, 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 I heard the Lord said, I told you, Joe, the finest, the finest. Oh, I can tell you stories. I can tell you stories. And I'm, 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 I'm kind of afraid to tell you, because you think this is just Joe blowing, blow, blowing and bumming about what he has. I'm not. I'm not. Honest to goodness, I'm not. I'm trying to tell you. If it works for me, it works for you. But I saw myself. I had, a, I had on Friday morning, Friday morning I had a Zoom, uh, a Zoom call with, a, with another uh, prophet from... Uh, from the Netherlands, he wanted to interview me. Interview me. They, normally they tell you up front what questions they're going to ask. He never told me a thing. And, and I was going to ask him, he'd just turn around and say, sure, you're a prophet, you'll know. <laughs> so, so I never asked him. So, so I switched on and we sat down, we sat down and, and uh, he began to interview me about who I am and what I'm doing and uh, so they can publish all this stuff, you know. And, and I started to interview me. And, and I, after it over, he said, now prophesy to me, Joe. Prophesy to the nation first. Now, could you prophesy to me before you go? And then he said, I'll prophesy to you. So, so I, I prophesied to him. And, and, and it's just all recorded, you know, for an interview. And then he prophesied to me. And then things changed. All of a sudden, he got up from his seat. While we're still alive, he got up from his seat. And another man sat down in the seat. And, 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 and he's sitting, he gets real close to the camera and he looks at me. He said, Hello. <laughs> I said, hello, and who are you? I suppose the thing is, you're the prophet, you should know who we are, you know. Anyway, but uh, he said, he said, who are you? And, and this other guy's voice, he says, this is a, a brother in the Lord. He also is a prophet, but uh, he wants a word from the Lord from you. So I looked back at him, I said, okay, write this down. So I started to prophesy over him. And then he stopped then at the end of that with tears in his eyes. He says, I will prophesy over you now. I said, go for it. And so he started to tell him. As he started to talk, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. And, and it was like I was hearing his words in the distance. And his words were painting a picture for me for the next years that lie ahead. So I'm not going to die young. I'm not looking at somebody and say, he's not going to die young. God doesn't give you fees and then take you home in the midst of it. No, no, no. So, so as he's telling me about what's happening in the future. And, I, and let me tell you something. When this guy finished, uh, uh, he, he came on and he says, uh, I am from Barcelona. No, he said, I am from Spain. I, I, I am a prince. And the minute he said that, I could see myself preaching in Spain. I could see it. It wasn't just, so, ah, Joe, come on. No, no, no. I, this was literal. In the midst of this prophetic atmosphere, I could see it. He wasn't inviting me, but my, but my spirit lit up. 
the canvas sort of opened up real quick, and I could see it. I could see myself stand up. I could see the city. I could see the, I could see the type of people that I was going to minister to. And I shot from one to another to another. I knew this wasn't conference time. I knew this was traveling a little bit out there. But I, and, I, and, and, and he blessed me, and I blessed him, and we're off our way. And we shut it down, and I, I texted the guy back. I said, if you have a record, I'd, I'd like that record. And he texted back, and he says, haven't got a record. He says, write down what you can remember. I thought, that's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. But that vision didn't leave me. So I went down to Laura and I said, we're going to Spain. <laughs> and she says, well, I have to get new shorts and sandals. <laughs> oh, no, no, she said, it's ministry, isn't it? I said, oh. <laughs> uh, I said, when? I said, it hasn't happened yet. And there's no invite yet. But I said, as sure as I'm standing here, we'll be in Spain. When God visits you, it becomes so real that nothing can steal it out of your heart. I have learned, I'm closing now, but I've learned over the years how to keep my imagination open. Because something said, something happens, and your imagination grabs it real quick. Have you ever noticed he's talking about going there, talking about there, and your imagination just glances out and grips that and puts it back inside you? Most people who doesn't know what they're doing just say, "Ah, I'm the one," and they switch it off. It's like it's nothing. And God started back and said, "What have you just done? I'm trying to load you up here. I'm trying to fill your imagination because out of one of them is the real deal." I've learned over the years to keep my imagination open. Keep it open so when God goes to say something, I've learned over the years prophesying. You prophesy to 100 people, 100, 200, start prophesying down them. You're going to be saying things to people, and suddenly, suddenly you'll turn around and say, I'd like that. Look at somebody say, I'd like that too. Because <laughs> suddenly your imagination reached out and grabbed what somebody else is getting, and you said, ah, I, I'd like that. Look at somebody say, I'd like that too. If you learn to keep your imagination open and grab whatever's called, grab, see it, see it, see it. And let me tell you something, if your thoughts get a hold of it and you start thinking about it and you start meditating on it and you start thinking about it, it'll move from just the thoughts and ideas over into imagination. And when it's hibernating in imagination, one day you'll see yourself doing it, or a scripture will be there for it, or you hear the Lord saying, now is the time, and suddenly you have a vision, you have a plan, you have a path, you have a road that you can go on. Wow. There's nothing mystical about this. God equipped you. He put the stuff on the inside of you so you can switch it on and do it. What are you seeing yourself doing? Where, where, how do you see yourself health-wise, wealth-wise? How are you seeing your relationship? How you, where are you going for holidays? What car are you driving? Where are you going? Where are you living? You don't want to live where you are anymore. We'll start going to get a brochure on houses. Visit Ali. He'll, he'll take you around every show house in town and say, buy this one, please. That's right. That's right. You need to go ahead. He's in the state agent. He'll show you. He'll bring you the brochures in. And, and so, but if you don't put the picture in front of you, you'll never get it. But if you can get it, my Lord. You know what? Mothers have great pictures for their children doesn't even matter if it's a God thing or not. They see Sonny Boy going to be a doctor, Sonny Boy going to be a nurse. He may not even want to be it. But you're going to put him through that education because you can just, I can see him do it. That's right. You know what you want to do? Switch that off. Switch it up. If you want a real one, get that boy or that girl to a prophetic meeting and let the prophet prophesy over them. And when God speaks about what his destiny, start build your imagination around that destiny that you've just heard God speak it and keep talking it over them, talking it to them, dreaming with them until it becomes a major part of their life. If you don't, if you don't, somebody else will fill your head with, you should be this or you should be that. And then they'll put you down a system you never wanted to be, and 20 years later, you hit the job. And you're Monday, you wish it was Friday, and when it's Friday, you, you hit it because it's coming on Monday again. And you, you're, you're dead on arrival. You need to find out who you are and see yourself. See it. If you can't see it, it's not going to happen. If you don't see it, it's not going to happen. You've got to do it for yourself. So what are you seeing? Where do you see yourself going? I I'll finish it. What do you see yourself? What do you see for your family? 
What do you, what do you, what do you see for your career? Dead end straight, going nowhere? What do you see? What are you seeing? What are you seeing for your finances? How do you see that? What are you seeing? Arise, obey. Well, you don't understand. I, I, uh, my company is not a big company, so they don't earn much. <sighs> is God your source or what? You got to get beyond where you are right now and see over the wall. Look into, look into the distance. What are you seeing about your relationships? What do you see about your ministry? What do you see? I, I, I watch ministries die. I watch people for, in ministry retire young. I've, I've seen uh, uh, people closing churches. And I can tell you why. It's the same every single time because they lost their vision. They, they did this. They did, God maybe gave them a dream about going to Bible school or going to that. And they finished that and then it's all over. Nothing fresh, nothing new. And so they walk in circles. You know all that you had to do is go back and ask the Lord for another vision. And he would give them the next part of the journey and the next. You know what keeps you on fire? You know what keeps you vibrant? You know what keeps you as salty as you were when you got born again? Is vision. I'm full of vision. I'm full of imaginations. I go to bed at night and, 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 and sometimes, you, you, you ever had that when you, you can't sleep? I think this is cracker. Because I'll lie in bed and I'll dream. I'll take, my, I'll take my thoughts in the direction I want to go. Where do we want to go the night, Joe? What do we want to do? Where will we see, will we see ourselves in, 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 in Spain? Will I see myself in hunger? Where will I see? And I can imagine myself being there till I fall asleep in an imagination. You have the ability to do it. I like it when you read the Scriptures and you can see the Scriptures coming alive on the inside of you. And you see yourself healthy. And you can see yourself well. That vision will pull you out of where you are to where God needs you to be. This is fantastic. God wants to switch on your imagination. Everybody shout, switch me on, switch me on. That's right, stand to your feet this morning. Spirit of the living God, I refuse to give my pencil to another individual or to a demonic spirit. I, f I refuse to give it over. You give us this canvas of our heart, the map, the road map, the, the blueprint. You give this to us. I'm not letting anybody else tell us and paint it. I got to hear it from you. When it hits my thoughts, my imagination, it'll paint another road, a, a headlay, a, a, a something I've not thought of before. And I know this, Holy Spirit, in the midst of that, in the midst of it, it'll become an imagination and it'll become a deep desire. And before I know it, it'll move from a deep desire over into this vision. So I know I've read the books, Holy Spirit, and I've read your Bible, and I've read your Word. And anybody who ever made a, di a difference in this lifetime always were driven by a vision. Because it started with an idea and a thought, and they went with it. We're standing in the midst of a church this morning full of Holy Ghost people people with dreams, people with ideas. They've got a great canvas. Tradition and cultures have drew and etched into it for years. Negative people that surround it have added their little se sequence onto it. The enemy has taken the pen every now and then and through circumstances painted another picture and we got a whole mess there in the canvas of our heart. So Holy Spirit this morning, we erase the canvas with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that will totally erase every wrongdoing because the blood of Jesus forgives us of every sin. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, our canvas is white. It's white. It's clean. It's ready to be drawn upon. And Holy Spirit, we give you permission. <clears throat> we hand you the pen and we say to you, Begin to draw in our hearts. Begin to draw something for our future because if we can take the future that direction, we're taking our children and children and children with us. They'll just follow in the same suit. Father, if I'll dream the dreams and show how it works, I can teach people and then they can do it. I pray this morning that their canvas will begin to light up even in this atmosphere that they'll see themselves not having to work eight to eight 
burnt out and tired with no money to do it, that they'll see themselves not having to go to the same location every year because they can't afford to go anywhere else. And to begin to see themselves standing on platforms, preaching, singing, writing songs, moving in the Holy Ghost, doing things that, that they'd really love to do but never got an opportunity. I pray right now as I'm talking that the, the canvas of their heart will begin to light. Ripples will go to cross it that will form pictures and suddenly them see themselves stepping out of boring and ordinary over into the extraordinary. The enemy's fighting people, trying to keep them down, stealing, robbing, and killing. But we're looking beyond that right now. If that doesn't come because the devil stole it, we're not going to park at that door. Something greater over here can come. Something greater over here can come. We're looking for a better tomorrow, and it has to start on the inside of us. So this morning we sanctify our heart. We sanctify the canvas. And I pray right now that it will start to glow on the inside. We'll see ourselves coming up and going out and moving like never in our lifetime before. In Jesus' name. Amen. Absolutely. All right.